Okay, we're ready. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed the Geek Nick. Everybody went over to the, uh, the fabulous Geek Nick, and thank you to uh, O'Reilly, Josette, and everyone else for helping out with that. It was really cool. Hanging out by the bandstand and stuff. So thank you for that. It was really funny to see people in the park reacting to us throwing angry birds things around. Um, <laughs> and looking at my hat and wondering what I was doing. And somebody said, where's the Sainsbury's? And I heard someone else say, follow that cowboy. <laughs> so I really don't know, I know that, I feel quite good about that actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's quite interesting. All right, so um, I, I've done the ultimate lazy thing of deciding to try and get user-generated content, which you know, uh -huh. relies on you guys a lot. Um, so we've got a fabulous panel of people here, and I've got some ideas for topics that we can discuss and stuff, but we really want you guys to, ask questions, you know, how often do you get a chance to ask these people questions and so on, and we can discuss them and all that kind of stuff. Um, so let me introduce you to the panel. So to my left here we have Karen Sandler, who did a great talk earlier. Um, she's the Executive Director of the Gnome Foundation, and a uh, former lawyer. Are you still a lawyer? I'm still a lawyer. <laughs> oh, sorry, just talking into the mic a bit. I'm, I'm still a lawyer. I'm, sorry. I'm still doing pro bono work with the Software Freedom Law Center, and okay. some for the Software Freedom Conservancy, and I'm general counsel of Question Copyright still. Wow, okay, so legal questions for Karen then. Um, <laughs> Don't ask legal questions, they're always really boring. <laughs> right, okay. As you will have to say this is not legal advice. This, is this does not constitute legal no, advice. I don't think she has to in this country. No, well, no. maybe not. Maybe not. Okay, so obviously you've all, you probably all saw Simon's talk before. So we've got Simon Fitch from OSI. Um, we've also got Mr. Stuart Langridge from Canonical. Um, I believe you're working on the Buncey one and all that mostly? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and some guy on the end does a podcast or something. Um, <laughs> I don't know who he is, but he seems to work his way up. But yeah, we've got Fab as well. So um, if anybody's got any questions as we go, please chip in, because otherwise I'm just going to be sat here going, uh, uh. Um, <laughs> so the first kind of topic that I wanted to discuss, and I've, I've asked the guys about this because I knew it could be a bit controversial and stuff, but I should also find out these people are representing themselves and not their companies and so on. So before <laughs> Ack gets in trouble or anything else. <laughs> Not that you need my help to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've got to make that clear. But um, yeah, something I wanted to kind of talk about is the future of the desktop, I suppose. I know it sounds like an old subject and stuff, but the future of the Linux desktop as I see it. Because obviously we've got GNOME 3 just come out, um, and that's kind of Fab's developing. Wearing Fab's wearing the GNOME 3 shirt. Um, yeah, and we've got, uh, well, KDE 4 is still going strong. We've got all these other options and stuff. Um, but I want to try to get people's idea, uh, opinions. I mean, Simon talked earlier about um, making compromises and so on, yep. and um, using the Mac and stuff. So I want to ask you a little bit about what you feel is better, maybe about the Mac interface and stuff like that. So I don't know. Is that, no, it's not, that's not actually relevant to the issue, to be honest. With you. Right. Oh, well, fair enough. Um, that's, good. that's a good point. I'm saying I have trouble here. Um, <laughs> I should have brought a lasso. I really go for the cowboy metaphor. Um, yeah. All right. And so let's kick this off with. Um, I don't know. I'm going to pick on Karen. If I apologise, but. What, how, what do you think the future of the Linux desktop is? Obviously GNOME 3, in your opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, well, it's one of the, GNOME 3 is one of the reasons why I decided to go over to GNOME. So I've only been at the GNOME Foundation for like a little bit over a month now. So it's all still pretty new for me, but one of the reasons why I found the job so appealing is that GNOME 3 is, is really a, a departure and something new. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I think that with a redesign, like GNOME 3 has, you know, we can really reach a lot more people. I mean, it's, it's still early days, but you can sort of see going forward where this is going. And I think that that's really amazing. I mean, do you think in some ways that um, obviously GNOME 3, it's, as you say, it's a big change. Um, and we had all the kind of teething troubles with KDE 4. Do you think that's happening a little bit with GNOME 3 now? You're kind well, of feeling your way into well, it. Well, uh, what Linus Torvalds has been saying. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, th I think there will be any time you do something different and you make a departure, you try something new, you're going to, you, you can't make everybody happy all the time. And since GNOME 3 is new, it's going to take some time for people to get used to. And some people are going to decide not to use it. Um, I hope that uh, more people do decide to use it. And, um, you know, I think part of the point of the GNOME 3 redesign was to reach less technical users. Um, although I do know a lot of highly technical users have been happy with GNOME 3. We were just talking, I was just talking to Fab about this on <laughs> an interview that he's a GNOME 3. I hope you're not implying that I'm highly technical. Uh, that's true. <laughs> but no, I, you know, I know a bunch of hackers who are really using GNOME 3 for development. So um, I think that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, but as I said, you know, some things are still new. There are still kinks to work out. And I think even with that being said, we're going to be in a similar situation where some, I mean, I think uh, Linus moved to 
film after he was frustrated with KDE. So I think I think this is one of the things that we're just going to see and we're going to have to live with and hope that we can improve and learn from. Mm. Okay, so I mean that, that sounds to me like it's one of the great things. I think it's kind of like a double-edged sword. We have a lot of choices, but at the same time, does that divide the you know, development and, and the resources and stuff. I don't know. Simon, what's your favourite Linux desktop and what do you think about it? Um, at the moment, I'm in love with, uh, with my Honeycomb tablet. Okay. So, uh, I actually think the future of the Linux desktop is the, is the tablet. Uh, wow. And, future uh, of the Linux tablet. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting here. Um, I think that the Linux has had its chance to be on the desktop and uh, it's done a, a damn good job of being on the desktop for a lot of people. But unfortunately, the desktop is going away. So uh, it, li li Linux may well be well may well become even more popular on the desktop, mm -hmm. but uh, by percentage, the number of people using a desktop is going to go way down, and most people will be interacting with Linux through some other interface. How many? How much of an interactive panel do you want this to be? Are you interviewing yeah, us? Yeah, yeah, that's all right. like as a, much as possible. <laughs> mano, mano, a mano. Yeah. <laughs> way that we're computing has changed, has changed, but I think that it's a very sensational to say that the desktop is going away. Yeah. And I think anyone but who needs to generate content of any kind or wants to sit in for a really long amount of computer use where, um, you know, I, I, I think we'll want to sit in a, in a comfortable seat with a big screen and, um, you know, a comfortable, um, you know, a keyboard or some other way of inputting. And I, I think that, that it's a little bit sensational to say the desktop, I mean, it's changing and the way mm -hmm. that we, our devices interact with each other and, and maybe we're going towards modular things. But I still think the desktop is, is a, an important and long term. Well, maybe, but we're in a really exciting time where there's, there's more choice than just um, things that are designed to be really complicated desktop systems. So we've got Chrome OS coming, where your desktop is going to be a browser. We've got uh, Honeycomb, where your desktop is a, is a, a, a haptic surface. We've got KDE and Gnome busy doing the traditional stuff. We've got Microsoft failing to innovate at all. We've got um, Apple on the verge of turning, turning actively evil. There's all this, you know, there's, there's, there's all this, there's all this, all this new stuff happening that on there. And I think that the viewing, believing that the future of the desktop has got to be like the history of the desktop, I think is the, is the problem. Because I think there's going to be a whole lot of people whose only experience of a computer is going to be through a Chrome browser soon. And there's going to be a whole lot of people whose only experience of a computer is going to be through a haptic um, tablet, the tablet screen that's this big and probably has got a keyboard you can option associate with it when you need it. And I think that all of these options, and the thing that really excites me about them is so many of them have got free software uh, underneath them and within them, and the software pr freedom is preserved for the user. <coughs> and I, I think that is what's fantastic about what's going on. Mm. Uh, I'm conscious I don't want to leave the other guys out. So, yes. So, Ak, um, what, what's your feelings on the future of the, the well, next interface? It, it, it's interesting what Simon says, that uh, the idea of software freedom is best embodied by turning my computer into a dumb terminal and having Google own all of my data. Thanks a lot for that. Um, <laughs> so what exactly is a good term? <laughs> it's, it's not me from saying that software freedom is the defining characteristic of this thing. The other thing I think is interesting is when you say Microsoft haven't innovated in any way of me defending Microsoft, you really Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I've used Windows. That might have been hyperbolic, I don't know with you. <laughs> the last bit of that was right, I think. Um, it's... <laughs> see, watch people catch up. Um, <laughs> um, I've used Windows Phone 7, and I think it's quite good. Now, I have no intention of using it on a phone, because it requires the best of the Microsoft stack, which I don't have. It requires me to have an exchange server. I can't write software for it on Ubuntu, whatever. Not interesting. But, what they've actually done, which I thought was interesting, is genuinely innovated. Android, much as I use it every day, and Honeycomb's good and everything, it's, it's hard to make the case that it's not a flagrant rip-off of iOS. Windows Phone 7 is genuinely different. I think it's genuinely innovative. No one gives a shit about it. <laughs> but they've actually, they've actually sat and gone, let's build a great phone system. No, no one's going to use it because they've missed the boat. But Microsoft are now in the position that we've always been in, that we can come up with innovations, but nobody listens. What I think is interesting is, when we talk about the future of the free desktop or the future of the Linux desktop or whatever, the problem is not doing technical innovation because we're actually quite good at that. The problem is, how do we get people to pay attention? Yes. 
And, and I think that's that's the critical question to ask because I, I think that I'm, you know I, I interviewed the guys who are working on WebOS for Hewlett Packard when I was over at Oscon last week, mm -hmm. and they've got some fantastic technology. I mean, WebOS is mm -hmm. awesome. You know, it's like HTML desktop. They're using Node.js for system services. You can write system applications in JavaScript. The thing is awesome. But the problem they've got is that to get to market, they've got to leverage some sort of ecosystem. And they've decided they're going to be HBO linked. So, oh, goodbye WebOS. Yeah. Um, and um, this is the problem that, that, that I think we've got to face when it comes to the software freedom dimension, which is we've got all the people in this room persuaded. We haven't got all the rest of their families persuaded. And we haven't worked out how we're going to do that yet. Yeah. Sorry, um, I, I was going to give Fab a chance to talk, but um, I'm just going to quickly let really Andy got a point. Yeah, well, okay. well, I'm sure that won't last too long. Um, sorry, mate, I'll give just a second. Andy wants to make a point about something. So if you've got a point, by the way, and you want to say anything, just shoot your hand up and someone will bring you a mic eventually. It's there. Hello, I've got the mic, yes. I think it's on. But I might be wrong. Anyway, so a um, couple of interesting things. I was going to, I was just stunned by some of the things that I was attempting to tweet them that some connectivity issues. So Simon, to say Microsoft isn't innovating at all is just bizarre when they're the only company with Connect and and Windows Phone 7 is which, as Simon uh, says I think they're bought, right? Connect. They bought a company which was innovating yeah. and now they have Connect. Yes. So but there's some amazing things that could happen out of those kind of technologies. Um, Stuart was mentioning Google and you know making your desktop a dumb terminal, having everything owned in the cloud. Well, you know, okay, you could do personal clouds at home, but then you come back to the web OS. Well, that's exactly. I mean, HTML5 desktop, you still got stuff in the web, you know, on the cloud, in the in the interweb somewhere. So I just find some of the the viewpoints that I'm hearing can't quite. I, I should be clear here, I think storing stuff in the cloud is a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of have to do that, though, not you? Just, is who's just, just to be clear about this, I think it's a great idea. I, I don't have a problem with it at all. I just find it interesting to hear Simon talk about software freedom and storing everything on someone else's servers in the same breath. So we've got a challenge of working out what software freedom means in the cloud, I think. And that, uh, the, the, the great question is, um, how are we going to project those principles into the cloud? And I think the, the answer has got to have a lot to do with federated software. Uh, I don't think there's any, any problem with the cloud. What I have a problem with is uh, all of my identity and data being under the control of somebody whose only relationship with me is a terms of service I don't have the time to read. And uh, I, I think that, I, that I'm very keen to get off. I don't want to get off Google. What I want to do is I want to get on something that's federated with Google. So that on the days they're evil, which is all alternate Tuesdays, um, I, I can flick a switch and I'm using my federated service instead of their centralized service. That, that's that's where I think the sort of place I think we've got to go to. Okay, so um, Fab, you need to be serious. I'm asking myself. I'm I'm really scared, and this is interesting because I love Android. I've been an Android user for a long time. I'm really scared that if the desktop's dead and Android is our future on computers, Android is barely free software, and in some cases, as in cases of Honeycomb, it's not even open source yet, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> that that kind of really scares me. Um, if the desktop, I think if the desktop is dead, um, we have lost, because I think it's awesome to, to talk about, yeah, we federated cloud services, but the reality is all these companies, they have no interest in doing that. Google has no interest whatsoever in federating with anybody. Because they make they make their money from owning all of your data. Well, I think that's kind of comparable to the the argument that DRM that going without DRM was not in the interest of any companies, but because music buyers and the public were choosing to go with server you know with services that didn't have DRM, then you know Apple had to you know, the, the, the key DRM users had to shift away from it. That we as consumers really yes. have a lot of say in this if we act with our money. Okay. I, I, I don't think actually that Google wants to have all your data. I think they just want to have handled it once. Which is what yeah. the data portability stuff is yes. about that, that they're mm. working on. Yeah, right. I'm sure you can get your data in and out of Google's yeah. that, that was her probability. I mean, I use Google for just about everything. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm very vocal on saying I'm not really scared about it because I'm, I don't think Google wants my data. They want an aggregate of all our data. They don't want to sell me specifically. I mean, they're not like sending me emails. Hey, Fab. Um, you like hats? When you buy, do you want to buy this hat? Right? They, they try to get aggregate stuff, but 
that's just as long as they're doing that. I mean, at the point where they have my data, they could decide tomorrow or next Tuesday that they're evil. Yeah, okay, right, well, we've got a couple of points from the crowd here. So we've got a gentleman, hey, um, I'm another one that doesn't think that desktop's dead just yet. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I do worry a bit about is the kind of death by dog food I'm saying. We're all using these kind of, I'm using Unity, GNOME 3. They're making the use of a lot of metadata that we're putting in and it's getting history over time and making things a lot more relevant, which is awesome for us. But when my girlfriend uses it for the first time, it doesn't have a metadata, it doesn't have a history, and everything is really hard to discover. I mean, how do we address that? Because when she goes in and starts looking to see what apps are there, it's a really complicated process. But mm -hmm. when she goes back the next day after using a few, she can see her favorite apps. Okay, so the, the question there seems to be how do we address that, which is a hell of a question. So who wants to try and tackle that one? I'm going to pick on someone if you don't volunteer. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we can do that. I, I think Eck can do that. I think uh, the cloud is actually the answer to that. Yes. Um, at the point where we, where we get to the cloud, where we, where we can are in control of our data, we can put this data in, in the cloud and then share that out. Like if we get a new machine, um, you know, can do that. Mm -hmm. I, I actually, it isn't, the, my concern isn't that we can make that happen because I actually think Google can already do a really good job of solving that problem for you because they've been watching your girlfriend for quite some time now and um, they know quite a lot about it. Um, Plain is the, moving the, in the, uh, his girlfriend. <laughs> the, 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 they, they, they know my wife pretty well as well. Right, wow, okay. uh, the, 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 the problem isn't that, the problem is uh, what you do when you don't want them to, um, to, to know what you're doing. Uh, you know, all these old-fashioned technologies that aren't aware of the people who are using them, they're going, they're going to go away. We'll only be using technologies that are aware of the context in which they're performing fairly soon. Mm. And the question is, who's going to provide that context and on what terms? And I think that's, that's the reason why Google wants to touch all your data as it passes through their servers. They, they don't want to own it. They just want to have uh, been loaned it for a few moments. And uh, the real question is, what are they going to do with that experience? And are you going to get to decide uh, what they use it for? That's the real concern about all the metadata. But that's exactly the point. You come back to the fact that I want things to be personal to me. I don't want to use a system which is identical for everybody. I want it to adapt to what I do, to work with what I think, to work exactly the way I want. And to be honest with you, I'm quite happy to outsource working all that stuff out to someone else because I can't be bothered. Right. So some people are not like that. Some people will absolutely think, no, 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 I don't, want, I don't want any third party. I don't want any company making those decisions for me. I want to make it all myself. I'm prepared for it to be harder for me. I'm prepared for there to be less customization. I'm prepared to have to do more setting up. I'm prepared to have to tweak things myself. And that's fine. You're absolutely at liberty to do that. We want to avoid a situation where you are unable to make that choice, but I think we're doing a reasonable job of avoiding that. I don't, I, no one's obliged to use Google. Mm. Everyone chooses to because it's good. But I think, I think people don't really realize that there's a connection between targeted advertising and an integrated experience and surveillance. And I think we sort of need to talk about it more. And I know that this is one of the things that Mozilla is trying to do with Do Not Track. And there have been government issues in the United States and elsewhere about trying to raise you know, awareness about this. But I, for me, the most important thing is to make these choices very clear and very active as soon yeah. as you start using anything and making it clear and ongoing. Because right now, you know, I'm, I don't see ads. So you know, I, I don't really. But loads of people tell me that they want to see ads. And not only do they want to see ads, they want to see really targeted ads. To me, that's crazy, but they never think about the implications societally. They never think about the fact that if we do facial recognition, for example, in a, you know, and train our photos and train Facebook, then you know, we're going to be able to publish a, 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 a picture of a protest and have a government be able to identify everyone who's there. You know, I mean, it's, it's very easy to draw those connections, but it's not something we're thinking about, and we don't have choices right from the beginning. Yeah. It's all about building up a fabric of trust as well. So most of us have got an experience of Google that means that we've got a, a, a fabric of trust that means we don't think they're going to abuse the data they've got. Whereas uh, the, yesterday on Facebook I found that by agreeing to have it sync contacts, which I thought meant add my friend's phone numbers to my address book on my phone, Facebook were actually sucking my entire contact list out of my phone and storing it on Facebook for future use. Mm. Uh, now, um, that means that I've got a very, a very um, fragmented fabric of trust with Facebook, which is a whole lot worse than it was before. And I think that, that, that overall the key here is the transparency by the service provider and the, the ability for us to make conscious choices. 
I think that the big threat is unconscious choices or choices that are made for us. I think it's exactly the same discussion that Karen and I were having after I did my talk. Okay, I'm afraid I'm going to cut in because I haven't been very good at bringing in people in here. So um, we've got a gentleman there with the, with the mic wants to say something. You can change the topic as well, by the way. We're going to have to keep discussing Google. Um, so. So, so this was from a little bit earlier in the conversation. Um, the cloud is surely less of an issue for software freedom and more of an issue for data freedom, which I think you touched on with data portability. I don't want Google software. I want my data so I can stick it into Amazon software or my own. Um, and don't we need principles for data freedom as well as software freedom? And aren't they different? Well, if, if you have software freedom in the cloud, if, if you have an AGPL piece of software that you can run yourself, I think the point is that you have the choice um, then to run it yourself. I think it, it comes with... As long as you have Google's data center. That, that, that doesn't buy you well, anything. That's completely useless to you. The fact that I can say, okay, I can store my data maybe in, in, sit between you two. On, on Google.com, <laughs> or I can run their software on my own server, still doesn't mean I've got data portability at all. But at least you know what they're doing with your data, because you yep. can look at the software. You know how screwed you are. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's, oh, okay. Okay. that's actually part of the battle, I think, is knowing how screwed you are. But I disagree that, 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 that that's actually the answer, I'm afraid, Fabi. Okay, so we've got um, a gentleman in the red shirt there who wants to make Yeah, I'm going to go back to a comment that was made earlier on about mm -hmm. the fear of Android. And I think that that's absolutely the problem that we've got. That is where it's going. And open source needs to get into that space and we don't have that fear. And, and the whole free software part of it is that if we allow that to be owned by the proprietary vendors who are coming out of it, that's where we get that fear into it. Okay. Um, so, as I say, if anyone's got any more comments, I think someone there, uh, just just up the stairs. Oh, oh, oh my. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's a little bit of a free fall. Um, so, as I said, if you've got any other topics you want to discuss as well, don't feel free to bring them. It doesn't have to be free software related. Um, okay, here we go. So, if the desktop is dying and we're all going to tablets, how many of you reckon that Intel will be dead outside the server room in a few years? Mm, interesting question. Well, how many of us here have got tablets? I mean, Simon's got one. Um, Fab, you've got one now. I haven't got one. I can't afford one. Have you got a tablet computer? Jack, have you got a tablet? Mm, no. I can't so there you go. So the majority of the people on this stage have not got a tablet. Yeah, show hands in the audience. Yeah, how many people in the audience have got a tablet computer? Okay, mind, so keep in mind that he's got two. <laughs> he's got two. I, I want to say Everyone that. follow that guy on the way out. <laughs> Um, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I, don't think, um, I don't think it's the answer. I have a tablet, and it's it's not the answer. Like un unless they invent some kind of glass that that's, yeah. that's not affected by finger smudges. <laughs> the, 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 the place where it's important is that what the tablet does. It means you've got two. You've probably got two devices in your life, mm -hmm. and you're no longer satisfied with your data only being on one of them, mm -hmm. because you probably want whichever device happens to be the one in front of you to be the one that knows about you and can help you. And I think that's the, the, the radical difference that, t that having tablets makes. And that this was the huge difference that the iPad made for a lot of people, was they suddenly discovered that the computer with the chair in front of it and the mouse wasn't the only place they could do stuff. Mm. And that, that was a, 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 an awakening that just changed the way that things were going to work. So I think that, the, that it isn't about doing everything on the tablet. It's about that once you realize that tablets are actually not just something for your kids to draw on in chalk, Mm. You, re you discover a world where the desktop isn't the only thing you're going to use, and then you begin to ask questions about, well, what else could I do somewhere other than in that chair, in yeah. the office? And, and that's the revolution that happens. But the thing is, you don't have to use uh, proprietary service to have you know, cloud storage. I mean, there are other things. I know they're not really up to speed at the moment, but there are things like Sparkle Share that have got promise. But at the same time, there seems to be about 10 different projects all competing to be the same thing. And I know I might have some things on this because you kind of competing in the same field. Um, they're all trying to make an Android app. They're all trying to make an iPhone app. They're all trying to be everywhere and do everything. But are they going to succeed when you've got someone like Google who've already got all of this space? You've got Amazon who are massive in this space as well. And people know those names. Will they give someone else a try? I'm going to aim this at Act because I know you're in this field. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I, I, I can talk a little bit about the cloud stuff, but speaking as someone who works for Ubuntu One is therefore competitor in these things, I, mean, I think things like Sparkle Share stuff are great. Um, what, what worries me, a more general point there, is precisely that there are 10, in the same way that there are 10 video editors and so on. And a bunch of people will say, no, no, because that's because it's about choice and it's important. But equally, what we end up with is everything being unfinished. And this, to my mind, plays back into a word Simon used earlier, which is trust. 
Um, one of the things I don't like, looking at things like uh, the GNOME 3 shell launch, um, you had a bunch of people complaining bitterly about how stuff had changed and it wasn't right. Uh, we had exactly the same thing with Unity. Um, and you get a lot of, a lot of that. It's, it's about trusting the GNOME developers. It's about trusting the Ubuntu team to do things right. And we don't have that. We don't have that sense of trust. Everyone seems to think that, no, no, they know better than the people who are actually doing this. And what it means is we end up eating our own young. You know, um, we've got, uh, there's an example, this guy called uh, Jonathan Blow, I think his name is, called guy Braid. Is that his name? Yeah. Um, he, professional game developer, right? Decided he was going to port Braid to Linux. And so posted on his website saying, um, I want to do this. Um, but I've never used Linux before, so I need, to, I need to know how to do a bunch of simple game things. Like, how do I change the mouse acceleration? How do I trap the mouse in a box? How do I play one sound and then play another sound on top of it at the same time and mix them up and down? Just simple stuff that you need to write a game. And he got 342 different answers from people saying, you need to use OpenAL, no, you need to use Alsa, no, you need, you need to use OSS4. And everyone hated everyone else and denigrated all of the other answers. And in the end he said, you know what, the hell with this. If you guys can't get it together and come up with an answer, why the hell should we pay attention? And I think a lot of that's because we don't trust the people who are doing something to do it right. Everyone thinks, I know better, I'll do a different one. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, that's the freedom that we have in being yeah. able to do that. I mean, the alternative is what? Everybody used DirectX or something, and that no, is the, the way The, the alternative is Apple, where you have a lot of users that absolutely, totally trust Steve Jobs, love everything he, do, he does, and just, you know, just, just love that. And I, I, you know, as somebody who doesn't, I hate that. Which is fine, but then, okay, so the, the question then becomes, is it possible, is it reasonable that um, this massive variety of unfinished stuff, we have the choice to choose any of these unfinished things, is actually going to get us the success that we'd like. I think, I'm not sure about that, maybe, maybe not, but it's quite possible to think, okay, perhaps the future of Linux is us. We're not going to get into the mainstream because we think choice is more important. Yeah, uh, maybe that's a reason No, I actually agree with you. I, I think I, I've, I've changed. I've changed my mind on that quite over over <laughs> few years. I think you're, you're probably right. I think Linux is probably not the future of everybody, every user on the desktop. And I actually think we should embrace that, and we would be better in some ways if we figured out that we don't get anybody, we don't get all of all the people to use it. But I think, I mean, just going back to my talk from earlier, I think we as like a society are going to be kind of screwed if we don't move towards free and open source software solutions and free and open platforms because this is all like life and society critical stuff. It's not like. I mean, this, this is basically how we're, we're living our lives and how we're doing it together. So while I think that, you know, it's right that to some extent we as technically oriented people are going to be the ones driving this stuff forward, I think it would be a mistake if we just said we should embrace that and limit ourselves and not look to the outside, not look to, to everyone. I mean, what, that's one of the things Canonical is trying to do, to do is bring, um, you know, GNU Linux more to the everyday person. Yeah. And I, I really support that. But I would actually say that one of the ways that we can handle this trust issue is to focus a lot on nonprofit development. You know, help, I mean, I'm coming from GNOME, so I'm a little biased, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm dedicated. I, I, I make considerably less money now than I did in the private sector, and it's well worth it because I'm working on something I care about. And if we all kind of work together, it's a way to bring disparate companies into one decision making body. And I think that's really valuable. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to step on this point a little bit because we need to get. <laughs> we got Sebastian there, he's got a question. Right, um, I actually ended up with two points to make now because the discussion has moved on so no, much since <laughs> um, I actually would like to touch first on what you have just been talking about. Um, and I think there is a point to be made that in certain circumstances when it comes to freedom, when it comes to software, when it comes to strategy, you might have to end up making somewhat of a decision between the avenue that will bring you success and will bring you lots of users in the masses and will really truly spread the software, whatever you're doing, and true freedom in the sense that really, if you look closely, a lot of the concepts that are at the heart of the open source movement are 
impose a certain level of self-limitation on the speed of development of software. Many times you either have, want to have a big company or entity imposing certain decisions quicker in the process and that will move forward a certain project and will uh, let it grow faster, or you want to stick with really the organic approach and let everybody squabble and squiddle and for several years possibly until one natural winner emerges. And I do accept that if you're a large company trying to, to gain a, a significant market share, possibly that sort of approach doesn't really suit you, but let's not forget that a lot of great software has emerged in the Linux world and in the open source world through this great debate, through software being forked, through half of the people getting really cheesed off and then everything lagging for a few years and then somebody else coming up along and saying, well, actually, you know, it's not worth all this, let's start all over again. And it is a natural process. As I have to say, as a personal opinion, I'm not saying that necessarily it is the right one, I like, to a certain extent, the beauty of this system, the fact that the software sort of lapsed and everybody got annoyed and another software started. And yes, it is not great and it's probably frustrating if you are at the top of a big company, I don't want to mention any name of people present today, um, and you're trying to make a serious business out of it, yes, it's, it's maybe not really compatible, but it is how large parts of open source world has, have worked, and I think there's a certain beauty to it, and we, we shouldn't lose that. Um, this is the first point that, that uh, well, this is the I was going to say, much as I love you, mate, is there a point to this? Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is just We're friends, by the way, so I can say that. This is just a comment to, to the point where the discussion has reached right now when uh, somebody mentioned the word success and it dawned on me that, well, do you absolutely want freedom of choice at all costs or success? The two are not necessarily an automatic and all the time compatible, so you have to decide w which way you're going. Uh, mm -hmm. An absolute compromise between the two is not necessarily always possible. So it depends what is your main priority. Uh, coming back to the cloud discussion earlier on, I have to say that I am seriously concerned by the fact that a lot of open source people and, and freedom sort of advocates seem to be embracing the current cloud movement um, quite wholeheartedly without what I feel is enough questioning of the openness of the entire concept. We seem to be, I remember 10, 15 years ago, there was a time when we were really concerned if my email client software could talk to my server client software or to somebody else's server client software, if I could easily port my email archive from one system to another, from one client software to another, from one server application to another. And this used to be important. This has spawned over the year things like IMAP, which is a widely supported protocol right now. Um, the various backends for servers, such as the, the mail there and inbox formats, which allows you to migrate large um, archives of email between different pieces of software. And I think that is a quintessential part of software freedom. And nowadays, it seems that that has really taken backstage. Very few people seem to be asking, well, um, am I allowed to, um, can I write an applicate client application which will talk to such and such cloud services? Well, no, because actually, they use, in most uh, circumstances, a proprietary protocol which we don't know about and we don't understand. And they won't really let you write software that just plugs into different uh, uh, cloud services. So as far as I'm concerned, really, at protocol level and the data format level, there's a massive amount of incompatibility and closeness about it, which I think should be really concerning. Yeah, this brings up a question in my mind, and I'm going to spring this a bit on that. Can I write a client for Ubuntu One myself? Yes. Yeah, and it's all absolutely. documented. And Ab absolutely, you can. Yeah, there, are, you there, can. Are, there are two bits to Ubuntu One, um, data and files. Uh, the data stuff is all CouchDB. Um, uh, Apache project already exists. Um, mm. Perfectly reasonable thing to use. Mm. Um, the file stuff, we use a binary protocol to talk to our file servers just because it's quicker. Basically, mm. it's essentially it's essentially compression, but it's all documented, and the clients are all open source. They are open source. Well, the client yeah. server is open source, but the server end isn't, though, is it? Correct. Okay. Um, so, sorry, I just wanted to kind of yeah. clarify that a little bit. So, um, I think Alistair, you had your hand up quite yeah, a lot as well, so we need to kind of yeah, get more questions. If you've got any other topics and stuff as well, you can bring them up. So, far away. We would just try to define success uh, for Linux and open source systems. Um, my definition of success is it works for me. 
um, and I don't really mind too much how many other people use it as long as it, it works for me. And so I think that's how we should define our success. Um, the other th thing I wanted to bring up is this whole idea of how do we get it onto more people's standard everyday machine? Is it just that we're being too nice about it? Shouldn't we be getting a bit more in people's face about the ideals? Okay. Um, computer Liberation Front. We're here to liberate your computer. Well, I, Power I mean, to the people. This is part of why I realized that I had to start talking about my heart condition, even though it's not something that I would have typically wanted to have said in a public place that I have a heart defect. Like, but I think thinking about the fact that I, my life counts on the software and it's not being reviewed and that I can't even see the software that's in my body sort of like takes these issues to a, a, an emotional place but also a, you know, one of those critical places. And I think that discussions like this about why are we gonna count on our, on our software? So like we can see it in those situations. You know, in the United States, when we had problems with the Diebold voting machines, you know, when you start to see how we count on our software, you sort of understand why it needs to be safer and why it needs to be reviewed. And software freedom is an essential component of that. So I actually think there's a really, real strong bit of advocacy here. And everybody in this room who's here because they care about these issues needs to start talking about it. And, and so I think we should get in people's faces, but not necessarily in an aggressive, negative way, just in a, we want our software to be safe and we should start choosing solutions that are. Okay, I think Popey wants to... Uh, yeah, I want to come back to a point that was made earlier about whether this is for us or for everyone, for you know nerds or, or just the average person. And it alarms me, the, the idea that the, the free software should be just for the enlightened like us. My four-year-old son uses free software, he uses Tux Paint, he absolutely loves it. He can print something and use up all the ink in my printer, very capable, using <laughs> Linux. And I would not want him to be deprived from uh, having the opportunity to use free software. And if we only went down the road of nerds only, everyone else can get out, then I don't want to be a part of it. Which is exactly how I feel about it. My, my dad plants Ubuntu. I know your mum does. No, <laughs> my yeah. mum would do. And yeah, my dad's absolutely fine with it loves it to bed, doesn't have a problem with it. I don't want it to be just for us either. But then that comes exactly back to the point that if the notion of freedom of choice being the all-trumping most important thing is limiting it to just us, then how much of that, if any, are we prepared to sacrifice in order that my dad can use it? Some people may say I'm not prepared to sacrifice anything, and if that means that um, only nerds use Linux, I'm fine with that. I don't think it's a, it's a nerd geek other people issue. I think when I said we have to uh, we have to figure out that we can't get everybody to use it. What I mean is, for example, my parents technical level about the same for both of them. My father uses Windows. My mother uses Fedora actually. Um, and my father just, father just doesn't use um, Linux because he doesn't care. Like people have different um, people care about different things. There are people who don't care about freedom of choice. And there are people who don't care about their data being free and other people do. And they don't have to necessarily have to be geeks. Um, they're just non-geeks that care about... Um, pretty heavily correlated. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really think so. Like, for example, my, my mother, she, she's much like me. If you give her a match, it, it, it would drive her insane that you can't drag the, the, the bar at the top somewhere else or that, that she, doesn't, she can't change stuff. And she's not a geek. She just wants to have control over how she uses her computer. Mm. Okay, so we got another point there from uh, yeah, one of Just to go back to the, uh, the success or failure question, one of the things that was mentioned earlier was that the desktop may go away and be replaced by a nice big screen with a keyboard that you can pair up optionally and you can sit in front of your big screen and do that. Why will that work this time? Because I've got a couple of web TV boxes sitting up in my loft and it didn't work when everybody's applications were on the cloud. I've got a Prestel box, and it didn't work when everybody's applications were gonna be on the node 20 odd years ago. Why is it gonna be different this time around? Wow, okay. Who wants to tackle that one? Why is it gonna be different this time? Go on then. Yeah. Um, I don't think that the, the problem is that it didn't work last time. We tend to swing from um, centralizing everything for efficiency and then someone says now we should decentralize it because it's cool and then people say but there's a benefit to centralizing so you had mainframes 
which had nothing but dumb terminals. And everyone went, I'll tell you what we actually want to do. We want people to run uh, applications on a computer, on their desk. And then we started moving everything back to the web again. So it's just, every time you're in one of these positions, using centralized apps, you can see the benefits of decentralization. So uh, we, we went through a stage of lots of stuff being on the web, and now we're starting to see processing getting pushed out to your browser again. This is what a lot of the stuff in HTML5 is about, about allowing work to happen out at the dumb terminal level. And I'm sure five or six years from now, someone will come up with some new damn centralized thing and we'll all start flocking to that again. It's, it's just the way the industry works. I don't think those things failed so much as they were overtaken by a new paradigm. You know, okay, so I think Simon wants to say something on this. So, uh, uh, like the point yeah, press, there was Prestel and there was Web TV, so this is the third time? Um, yeah. Think, you know things succeed the third time around. <laughs> that sounds lovely. I'm not sure that's even you to the of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the mic's moved, so I'm afraid There, there, there is actually a, a, an interesting effect that you discover, which is we, once something has gone really wrong publicly a couple of times, the people who attempt it the next time learn from those mistakes. And I think what we're going to see this time is not so much a dedicated big screen whose only role in life is to sit there being, being the place that the big eye looks at you from but rather that uh, one of your alternatives is going to be to plug something or connect to something so that the, uh, the environment that you're using is now shareable with lots of people or is on a bigger screen. And I'm already kind of in that space. You know, I've got a really big screen on my desk. I have a tiny little screen in the back down here. And I've got all the same things on both of them because I'm using free software and because I'm using um, uh, web hosted services to hold the data. And I think that's the reason it's going to work this time, is that it isn't just about being the, the one big screen. It's about being part of an environment where there's shared data that's a, a compromise between centralized and localized. Okay. Yeah, that's Prestel was pretty successful. But yeah, I like, I, 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 I like my Presto box. And, my, my, and Minitel was cool. Okay, I, I could discuss Presto boxes all day, but I think we've got to get to the question there. I think the first thing the audience. A very direct question. What would it take to end the civil war between Gnome 3 and Unity and have the two teams come oh, together? Yeah. <laughs> I, I just, how, how much, yeah, okay, no, but I, I think civil war is not exactly a, a, a term that either, either anyone on this stage would kind of go to, but I don't know. So, all right, so we do have a couple of people who may have thoughts on this. Um, so, what do you think, Karen? No, I, I want to know what it would take. Oh, you do? Oh, so, well, that's unfair on that, because he doesn't work on Unity. But I'm sure he has an opinion, he has an opinion on everything. Just to be clear, we are still working together. Canonical was very present at the Desktop Summit um, in Berlin this past week. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth appeared at a panel on copyright assignment that was moderated by me. Um, and there were a lot of Canonical developers um, participating and um, acting as sponsors in the, um, at the, the summit, and that was really great. And so there are a lot of places where there is still a lot of work going on. Yeah, I mean, my, I, I, I run one too, unsurprisingly. Um, and my desktop is 95% command free. Um, I happen to use a different desktop shell than, than GNOME has chosen. But um, presumably your question also is, um, what, what's good, when's the civil war going to stop between GNOME 3 and FVWM? Mm. Right? Yeah. I don't think they're, they're, they're just, they're just, it's just a desktop shell. It's like, it's like asking when the Civil War is going to end in between people who like their windows to be blue and those who like them to well, be green. I would disagree with that. It's, okay, it's a little more fundamental. Like, look, it's it's not no, because people are painting. Uh, a and pe pe people are painting um, GNOME 3 as deciding to want a war with Ubuntu. And I don't think that's the way it's all. Like I say, most of my desktop is a GNOME 3 desktop. We use exactly the same technologies. We use exactly the same application, we use exactly the same widget set, we use exactly the same underlying but it's my whole looks desktop. totally different and works different because your desktop drives me insane. <laughs> <for> <laughs> then, <laughs> then don't use it because you have free to a choice. Exactly, and that's, that's, that's my point. I don't think there's a civil war and I don't think it's, it's going to end. It's it shows choice. back to the point that somebody from the audience raised, this is how we work. This is how free software, I mean, there's been between GNOME, before that it was GNOME and KDE, now it's uh, GNOME and KDE and Unity. There's always going to be different stuff and there's always going to be some kind of infighting, but actually there's good stuff coming out of that as well. Do, do you think it's more serious this time because um, Canonical's trust has been eroded with that community? I actually don't think it's that serious. I mean, I can remember when it was going on be between GNOME and KDE and it was exactly the same thing. Um, I don't People like to read about fights. 
Yeah. It's the reason up until recently the news in the world was a popular newspaper. <laughs> because it's, it's more interesting to read about controversy. Imagine, you know, um, Linux News and Linux Format and Linux Magazine. Every month put out a magazine that says, everyone got on this month. <laughs> and that was it, and that's all it said. Right? I mean, that would be a heartening thing to read, but I don't think many people would buy it. So, it's, what it is is people wanting to trick up controversy where there is none. Well, right, okay, so, sorry, there's, there's some, but, uh, <laughs> I, 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 you know, and, I, and as I said at the beginning, I think that there, we're, we're, we definitely are working together, and I hope yeah. we can work together more, but to deny that there is a rift is, I, but, but, I, I'm, I'm one of those, like, call it like it is kind of people, well, so I feel absolutely. like, I don't so, want to just sit um, here and... <clears throat> okay, I'm sorry, folks, we're kind of running out of time, uh, um, but we could talk all day. I just want to leave it with a point. I want to say, war, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> See it again, hey, all of you, hey, hey, all right? Hey, hey, hey. And everyone go, <laughs> All right, so thank you very much to the wonderful panel, to Karen, Simon, Ak, Fab, and thank you for you for asking us. I'm sorry I didn't get around quick enough, but I'm, I'm not good at telling these people to show up, or any of the other people. Um, but thank you very much for watching, and we appreciate it, and discussing and stuff. Thank you. So next up, slightly big. <laughs>